This video is brought to you by Aeroparts.com. In this video, I'm going to be replacing the transmission in a 2008 Lexus IS 350. Now, if you're already underneath your car watching this video from your phone, I've put some links in the description so you can find where you need to go in this video without helplessly scrolling. But if you're doing this job for the first time, or you just want to get a better idea of what you're going to encounter when you're doing this job, then stick around for a little bit. Now the first thing I want to get out of the way is if you have a 6-speed manual Lexus IS250, this job is very similar except for one big detail. You have to remove the clutch fork on the manual transmission IS250 before you separate your transmission from your engine. Now the transmission that I'm installing in this IS350 is from a 2008 Lexus GS350. The transmissions between the two vehicles from the same generation are the same. Now this car had about 174,000 miles when the transmission failed. And I know everyone is thinking, why'd it fail? Well, take a look. The transmission had been leaking transmission oil from the pan gasket very slowly. It didn't really leave drips on the ground, but I had driven the car like this for years. Eventually it started to shift kind of rough into third gear, and then after some time, it stopped shifting in the third gear altogether. And now, it just got really, really bad where all the dashboard lights are on as you can see. Okay. Second gear. There it goes. See, it skips third gear. You can't put it in third gear manually. If I go third gear, it just kind of like jumps through third gear. It doesn't really... feel it shutter it's it's got all these crazy noises it's leaking i'm not gonna i'm not gonna bother with it uh, i'm sure that fluid coming out is gonna be disgusting we'll find out when i remove the transmission but it doesn't really like reverse it does go in reverse As you can see it slips really really badly this car needs a transmission now if i would have simply replaced the transmission pan gasket filter and fluid I would have saved myself from having to replace the entire transmission. This also brings me to my next and final point before we finally jump into this video. There is no such thing as lifetime fluid. Yes, some dealers and shops will tell you this fluid is lifetime and never needs to be changed. And they also call the transmission on the IS350 sealed. Even though it has a fill plug and a drain plug. All they mean by this is that the transmission fluid never actually leaves the transmission during normal operation. Compared to a traditional automatic that has transmission lines that run to the radiator to cool the transmission fluid, the IS350 has the opposite setup where coolant flows to a transmission cooler attached to the transmission. Also, the fluid doesn't get any exposure to dirt and debris from things like a dipstick, for example. My speculation as to why they did this was to discourage people from putting other products in their transmission and then taking the cars back for warranty claim. Probably kind of like this. Yeah, so I, I put some GM Synchro Mesh in my automatic Lexus and now it doesn't move at all, actually. I mean, it did, I put it in drive and it just doesn't move. What are we gonna do about this? Now, I'm not knocking Toyota on why they did this, but I think changing your transmission fluid every 60,000 miles or so is just a good rule of thumb. Without further ado, let's get started on this job. Now I'm going to be removing the exhaust manifolds. And in order to do that, I have to remove the airbox, the battery, and a lot of the other stuff that's in the way here. Now we're going to remove the intake tube. Unplug the mass airflow sensor, and we're going to remove the airbox. And you can see some bolts down here. All right, now the air box is off and out of the way. We have a whole lot more room to access the passenger side manifold nuts. But before we do that, we're going to have to remove the dipstick and the dipstick tube. The dipstick tube is held on with a 12 millimeter bolt. You're going to need a box end wrench to remove that. You see where that arrow is pointing? That's what we're going to be removing.
Now that we have the dipstick and the tube out, keep in mind there is an O-ring on the end of it. The camera isn't focusing very well here, but make sure not to lose that. If it's damaged, you're gonna to wanna to get another one. And if the tube is as dirty as mine is, you're gonna to wanna to clean it before you put it back on. Now we have a close up view of the passenger side exhaust manifold and catalytic converter. It's one piece. Now that we have the dipstick tube out of the way, there are six 12 millimeter nuts that need to be removed. I was actually able to remove all of them except the very back one right there where the arrow is pointing. Keep in mind that I highly recommend to use a six point socket and not a 12 point socket just because the bolts near the manifold, especially the driver side manifold are the last ones you wanna round off. And I just use a regular ratchet extension and my 6.12 millimeter socket. Now the next step is to disconnect the oxygen sensor on the passenger side. I'm going to give you a close up shot of that so you can see exactly where it's at. And it is right there. So you're just going to be disconnecting it. This is how I did it. Very, very straightforward on that. Now we have our oxygen sensor disconnected and we are going to start on the driver's side. We're going to pretty much remove all of the accessories out of the way, all of the hoses, all of the wire harnesses, anything that's in your way, I would recommend to move it out of the way. There's very little room to work on the driver's side so I do, I do recommend to practice some of your patience here it is just a very tight spot now we can see the manifold nuts on the top you know, I have arrows pointing at them so you can get a close-up look the hardest one of these bolts to reach is going to be the one on the very front and that is the one closest to the alternator that one is very difficult to reach so be prepared and here we are from the bottom there is an access panel the plastic access panel that's going to be removed so we can reach the bottom three nuts. And remember that six point socket, you're going to see exactly why I recommend it here. As you can see, there are the manifold nuts right there. I'm going to show you a close up picture in just a moment, so hang tight. I'm going to go ahead and remove the driver's side manifold nuts on the top. And here's a picture of how I removed the driver's side manifold lower nuts. It was a very difficult spot to record, so I did not record it, but I got a picture of the extensions and the deep socket that I used, a 12 millimeter. And of course, as I mentioned before, I highly recommend a 6.12 millimeter over a 12 point socket because that's the last place you want to round off a bolt. Now I'm going to be removing the driver's side oxygen sensor, disconnecting the driver's side oxygen sensor. And this is not really necessary, but it helped me. Do you see that corner? Uh, that was very sharp. I had to sand it down. I almost cut my arm up doing that. And I don't have big arms, but uh, in order to disconnect the oxygen sensor, I had to reach back there and it was uh, very sharp. So just a suggestion, something to keep in mind. Now I'm going to be removing the steering knuckle. I'm gonna mark it with wide out because I wanna put it back in the same position. Otherwise my steering wheel will be off center when I put it back together. I'm marking the top and the bottom and it is held on by a 12 millimeter bolt right here as you can see where that arrow is pointing and you can see how I have my wide out. I have both parts marked so I know what position it was in before I removed it. And then there is another 12 millimeter bolt on the bottom. You'll see it in just a moment. Now the top bolt is off and now we're going to do the bottom bolt and I actually marked the bottom with wide out as well. Uh, but now that I'm getting the other 12 millimeter bolt off, I went ahead and marked it with wide out as well. Now I can just remove it. I lifted it up and out. If you have some rust, it's going to be a little bit more of a challenge, so keep that in mind. All of this stuff under the car actually 
is going to be more of a challenge if you have rust. So that's something you really want to keep in mind here. Next, I'm going to be disconnecting the downstream oxygen sensors, and they are connected from behind the carpet inside of the vehicle, so you have to pull the carpet back a little bit to disconnect them. So I'm going to be removing some interior trim, and I did not record myself doing this, but I believe it's been a couple of years since I've done this to the time I'm posting this video, but the door sill also came off as well, and if you have the illuminated Lexus door sill, you're going to have to unplug it as well. There's the OBD2 port that's going to come out and the light. Make sure these, if you have one of these and it's not broken, then congratulations to you because all of those break. And here we have access to our driver's side downstream oxygen sensor. We're going to go ahead and disconnect that. You see where that arrow is pointing? That's what we're disconnecting. Now we're going to feed that oxygen sensor wire through so we could free up the exhaust. Now we have it disconnected and we're going to get it out so the oxygen sensor wire is freed up and can come off when we remove the exhaust. And of course I'm going to be doing the same on the passenger side. I'll show you how the interior trim comes apart. It's very easy on the passenger side as well. It just pops out. As you can see here, make sure to remove the footwell light. I'll show you that in just a moment. You see there, you just twist it and remove it. Now you can pull the carpet back. Now the passenger side oxygen sensor wire is exposed and you can go ahead and disconnect it. Now we have it disconnected. We're going to feed it through the bottom. And now our both downstream oxygen sensor wires are freed up. We got both of them freed up here. Once we move the exhaust, those will come off no problem. Now we're going to be removing the exhaust going to be disconnecting it from the catalytic converter or exhaust manifold and I have my box and wrench on one side if you have an impact then you you'll breeze through this step um, these bolts especially if you are uh, in a in an area where there's a lot of salt on the roads in the winter time you're probably going to want to use some heat to remove them maybe a torch or some penetrating oil spray them prior to even trying to remove them you might also want to consider buying new bolts as well because if there's a lot of rust, a lot of times these bolts just break off and you have to get new bolts to replace them. I'm going to be removing some of the exhaust braces but i'm not taking them off completely i'm going to start loosening some of this stuff up you'll see the method that i use to remove the exhaust i'm doing this by myself didn't have a second hand a second hand is going to be a big help here when you're removing the exhaust but what i chose to do was use a few older jack stands to hold up the exhaust as you can see here that's exactly how i held up the exhaust while i disconnected it so the whole thing didn't just come falling down Here we have another jack stand. Now that I have some jack stands partially supporting the exhaust, I'm going to remove that brace. And there's a third jack stand on the back of the exhaust. And I'm going to be removing the remaining exhaust bolts from the rear of the exhaust. Now I have all of my jack stands supporting the exhaust. You can just start lowering it and get it out of the way. Next, 
going to be removing the exhaust manifold and catalytic converter. Remember, we already have the nuts removed and loosened up. Now, maneuvering the exhaust manifold out is pretty straightforward. You're just going to want to be careful and pay very close attention to the oxygen sensor wire not to damage it because it does get come very close to the heat shields. Now our passenger side exhaust manifold, same exact thing, watch the oxygen sensor wire. And we got both of our catalytic converters out and we have a whole lot more working room. Both of the gaskets, the metal manifold gaskets are identical. They're not positional. It doesn't matter which side you put them on. Now I'm going to be removing some of the transmission wire harness. These need to be removed prior to dropping the transmission because they are attached to the transmission. And here's our starter. This is going to have to come off as well. Here's your starter up close. You can see the connectors. And we can start loosening up the bolts on the starter. Now that I have the bolts off, I'm not removing the starter entirely just yet. I have to remove the main power nut and make sure, like I said, you should have removed your battery at this point, but it should be removed. It should not be connected at all. We have the protector popped off, and we can take that nut off. Now that we have it disconnected, and we have it unplugged, we can go ahead and disconnect that, and it's all off. Now I'm going to remove the heat shields to access the drive shaft. We're going to start removing the drive shaft. I'm going to remove the center bearing. I'm not going to remove them entirely and I'm going to start removing the drive shaft bolts. Now the transmission is in park and the parking brake is on. So I'm going to remove whatever bolts I can. We're going to remove the rear heat shield as well in order to remove the drive shaft. Here we are removing the rear drive shaft bolts. And you're not going to be able to reach the top one. So what you're going to do is you're going to get up, put the car in neutral, undo the parking brake and spin the drive shaft so you can access the other bolts and then go ahead and get back up put it in park and put the parking brake on and now we're removing those last few drive shaft bolts we're going to loosen them up and get them removed Now I'm going to completely remove the center bearing bolts and now the drive shaft can come off. I'm wiggling it out here and again for the rust belt uh, eastern vehicles this part would probably be a little bit challenging. 
much more difficult than a car without rust. Now we are on the right hand passenger side of the transmission and there are two connectors that are going to be removed and the shift linkage. Now I'm going to remove that cotter pin. Right now I have the shift linkage pin out and I'm going to remove the shift linkage. And I'm going to start removing these connectors. And I'm going to unclip that harness from the transmission so it doesn't get caught on the transmission when I drop the transmission. We're on the driver's side of the transmission, just getting all the rest of the connectors detached from the transmission. I'm going to put that camera up in the transmission well so you can have a good look at everything that needs to be removed. Now we're going to remove the coolant lines from the transmission cooler. And be careful because coolant is going to spill. Have your drain pan ready. We're going to remove the second coolant line from the transmission cooler, and more coolant's going to spill. So have your have your drain pan ready. I'm now removing the ground from the transmission. It's a little ground cable. and fully removing the shift linkage and getting it out of the way. Now I'm going to get ready to remove the transmission cross member. I'm just loosening it right here. And keep in mind this supports the transmission mount. So if you remove this, it's going to tilt and it's going to spill more coolant. So I'm going to remove it in just a moment. Now I'm going to remove the plastic underguard. Now pay attention to the camera angle on this next scene and I'll show you exactly when. It's going to be right now. I'm going to move the camera up into the area where you're going to remove the torque converter bolts. You're going to use a bunch of extensions to reach the torque converter bolts. And you're going to rotate the engine from the crank pulley. With the socket, I'm going to show you in just a moment. See that socket on the left hand side where that arrow is pointing? You can spin the engine so you can access all of your torque converter bolts. And you can go ahead and start removing them. You're going to use lots of extensions, as you'll see in just a moment. Here are those extensions, and that's where I'm, that area is where I'm actually going to be putting them through so I can access the torque converter bolts and remove those torque converter bolts. All right, now all of the torque converter bolts are removed. Everything is disconnected from the transmission, but the bell housing bolts are still on. I have my transmission jack on and I'm lowering it carefully so I can let the rest of the coolant drain um, without it draining unexpectedly. So I have my catch can there, uh, my drain pan to catch any of the additional coolant. Now that's done, I'm going to start removing the bell housing bolts. Now this is the final step before you're able to drop your transmission. You have to remove the bell housing bolts and here's a view of the transmission tunnel. You're going to use a lot of extensions to get those bell housing bolts, especially on the top. And here we have a good view of how I have my, my transmission jack set up. I have it strapped onto the transmission to prevent it from slipping.
and we are removing the bell housing bolts. Now I've used the breaker bar to break loose the bell housing bolts. I didn't show it in the video, but it's something you're going to want to do for sure. And here I am just loosening the top bell housing bolts before I finally get them off. Now all the bell housing bolts are off and it's time to finally drop the transmission. You are at the halfway step. We're not done, but we're halfway there. We got the transmission finally freed up and out of the way. All right, now we're going to take a close look at this bell housing and the bolts. And you'll quickly notice that all of the bolts are not the same length. It's kind of obvious here, but I wanted to make note of that. You can easily see which ones go where. So just take note of that before you put them in, because if you don't, you're going to struggle a little bit. And that's the last thing you want to be doing is struggling, trying to put these bell housing bolts in. Now let's take a look at behind the engine. We have our guide pins. Now sometimes these come off with the transmission. All they are is guiding pins. You're definitely going to want to need them. They're very useful when putting the transmission back in and lining everything back up. Also, one thing to keep in mind is that if you are replacing the transmission with another transmission, sometimes the other transmission might have guiding pins in it already. So keep that in mind because that's going to interfere with you putting the transmission back on. Now let's take a look at our old transmission. The fluid is very burnt. It is black in color and it does smell very burnt. Another thing to note is the torque converter will push in to fully seat. Make sure that you have your torque converter fully seated before you install your transmission. This is my only measuring tool that I had at the moment, so take it with a grain of salt. But this one is fully seated. Now let's take a look at the amount of parts that came off of this vehicle. This is a pretty big job. You've made it halfway through. There's a little ways to go. There's a lot going on here. Now before I install this transmission, I need to show you something that's very important. There are six torque converter bolts. Out of the six bolts, one of them is an alignment bolt. You see on the right hand side, my camera isn't focusing very well here. But you can see the little bulge on the bottom of it. That aligns the torque converter up so you can easily get the other five of them on. If you don't put that bolt on first, you are going to struggle with the other ones. And, it, and this space is a very tight space to put these bolts on. So do very much keep that in mind. You're going to need to put the alignment bolts on first. Now it's time to get that transmission back in the car. Just keep an eye on your wire harness. Make sure you don't catch anything and damage the wires while you lift your transmission up. Do some adjusting. Getting the transmission to seat on the guiding pins. Here we have another angle. Now we have our transmission fully seated and I have a few bell housing bolts in already. Just make sure to obviously start them by hand to avoid cross threading them. And here I am working on the top bolts, once again starting them by hand, and then tightening them down. Now 
Now I'm going to emphasize this, and I'm going to really emphasize this. When you get your bell housing to line up and you get a couple of your bolts in, or maybe all of your bell housing bolts in, once your bell housing is fully seated onto your engine, I would immediately start putting on the torque converter bolts. And the reason why I would immediately start doing that before you start connecting anything else is because if you drop one of your torque converter bolts into your bell housing, you have to remove your transmission to retrieve that bolt. Now, if you've attached everything to your transmission, it is a complete disaster having to take everything off again to retrieve that bolt. But if you've just only put your bell housing bolts on, it's not that big of an issue. So I do want to make a big emphasis on that. And here's the footage of installing the bell housing bolts. I actually stuffed the rag here just to see if it would help to prevent one of the bell housing bolts from dropping. And it seemed to work for me. So I didn't drop any of them in, but maybe I got lucky here. So just keep that in mind. I'm going to use a blue thread locker. Some people have mentioned that they use red and it works just fine, but the blue also works fine here. Here's a close up of that torque converter bolt and I'm going to start tightening it. Here's a close up of the setup. I do have the extensions and a swivel socket. more close-up views now this may seem silly to have to remind you to not forget this plastic dust guard but if you've ever forgotten one of these working on a car putting your transmission on you'll know how it feels and the big debate on whether or not to take everything back off to put that on <laughs> So just a reminder, to don't forget that. Now we're going to be putting our starter back on. And I shouldn't have to remind you at this point, but I'm, I would imagine that the battery is not disconnected. It should be disconnected still, but just in case, just a reminder. Here's the reverse process. And here's our starter. Tightening up the last of the starter bolts, 14 millimeter. And make sure you don't drop your socket on your forehead. All right, now I'm gonna start putting the exhaust manifolds back on. I'm gonna start with the gaskets first. And there's a technique here that's not very special for particularly the driver's side manifold. And the reason why I needed to use this technique is because I was unable to thread the nut on from the, underneath the car. Now, the exhaust manifold doesn't hold on by itself. It will fall if you let go of it. So I actually ended up stuffing a rag underneath it. Now, if you're doing this, I would highly recommend to put a cushion underneath just in case it does actually fall or something to prevent it from falling, actually. Because the last thing you want is your $1,000 plus cat falling on the ground and damaging the honeycomb inside of it. The passenger side, I was ab actually able to get the nut from the bottom to thread one of them on so I can temporarily hold it on. So the passenger side was no problem at all. And here we have the passenger side right now. You'll see that rag on the driver's side, which did work for me. If you have a second pair of hands, that would be the best recommendation. 
But if you don't have a second pair of hands, you'll, you're going to want to secure the driver's side for sure before you um, attempt to climb on top of the car and start securing it. Here's that nut on the on the passenger side. Now we're back on the driver's side. Sorry, I have my camera going back and forth here a little bit, but you see that rag there. That's what's going to be holding that manifold in place. And now I'm going to go up top on the driver's side and start threading those nuts in to secure it finally and start tightening it down. Now, of course, it's going to be the same with the installation, but the very front manifold nut is going to be the hardest to install. Now the, these manifold nuts on the bottom get tightened up and we're going to go ahead and put that plastic dust guard on. Now I'm going to be honest with you here, this plastic dust guard I actually struggled with. I did get it back on but I, I wouldn't be able to provide a solid tutorial on that. But it is just a plastic dust guard. If you struggle with it like I did, just fiddle around with it, you'll get it. Now we're putting our transmission cooler lines, we're putting the clamps on to fully secure them. Now we're just finishing up getting those clamps on. Checking anything else that needs to be attached, such as the wire harness up here. Shift linkage, that's going to go on as well. Now it's time to reinstall the drive shaft. It's going to go on in the reverse order. I'm going to use the jack stands to temporarily support the other half of the drive shaft while I secure the drive shaft from the center bearing. I'm going to go ahead and wiggle the drive shaft in and start the bolts on the center bearing so it is secured in place. bolts for the center bearing going on now, just hand tightening them for now. And the drive shaft reinstallation process is the same process and procedure as the removal. Basically just going to put it in park, engage the parking brake, you're going to tighten any bolts that you need to tighten, and then you're going to go back up, put it back in neutral, disengage the parking brake, move the drive shaft so you can get to the other bolts, and then put it back in park, re-engage the parking brake, and tighten them up. we got our engine mount going on right now. Before I start all of that, just a few bolts that are going on this mount. Our 12 millimeter. I'm going to go ahead and put the transmission cross member on. It is directional. So make sure to take note of that. That arrow points towards the front of the car. I'm just going to give the transmission a little push and we're going to put some of those bolts in to get it in place.
and turning our attention back to the drive shaft we're going to start those bolts and we're going to use that exact same method that we were using to remove the drive shaft We're going to put our heat shields back on. And we're just tightening everything up. And now I'm going to reinstall the exhaust. I'm going to use the same method with the smaller jack stands that I have. I'm going to prop the exhaust on the jack stands and then lift the exhaust up from there and bolt it into place. Tightening up the rear exhaust bolts. And the second brace has the same arrow, points towards the front of the vehicle. Now it's time to feed our oxygen sensors back into the interior so we can plug them back in. Make sure to attach the water grommet. And we're going to put our interior trim back. And carefully plug everything back in. And well, that's broken, we'll just put it in the corner anyways. Getting that passenger side oxygen sensor plugged in. And we're going to put the carpet back and all of the interior trim back.
Now we're going to install our steering knuckle. And I actually lift it up first and then back down is how I got this one in. Going to use some WD-40, some sort of oil as well to help get it into place. And make sure that you look at where your whiteout, whiteout marks are. As we can see here, the marks are spot on. Our steering wheel is going to be straight. And it's not going to be crooked when we put it back in. So that's something you're going to want to take note of. This is why we mark it. Because if you didn't mark it, you're not sure exactly which position it is. And then you're just playing the guessing game. And at that point, you might as well just get the car realigned. Because who knows where it was. Tighten those 12 millimeter bolts up. And we got our steering knuckle back on. Now it's time to put all of the rest of the pieces together underneath the hood, starting with the dipstick tube. This one has to be cleaned. If yours is dirty, you're going to definitely want to do that before you put this back. You want all that crud going into your oil pan. And of course, that's after you've tightened the passenger side exhaust manifold nuts. Because you wouldn't be able to reach them very easily if the dipstick was in the way. Our air box goes back on. These are all straightforward. See, it has some mounting points where it goes. And we are going to start attaching everything here. We have all of our intake tubing. our main intake hose we're going to plug our airflow sensor in and all of the rest of the vacuum hoses start tightening them down All right, now I installed a used transmission in this vehicle, and I want to see how much fluid is in it. What I'm going to do is remove the fill plug first. Now this is a technique that should be practiced by everybody. A lot of people make the mistake of removing the drain plug before the fill plug, which is a huge mistake. The fill plugs are aluminum and they're 24 millimeter. They're very easy to round off, and it happens very often, a whole lot more often than you would imagine. The last thing you would want is to have the fill plug completely rounded off and have all of the oil drained out of your transmission. So this transmission had some oil in it. So great, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna measure how much oil came out and I'm gonna refill it with the exact same amount of oil. But before I do that, I'm gonna go ahead and replace the pan gasket and the filter as well. So I'm gonna start removing all of the bolts around the transmission pan so I could drop the transmission pan and change that gasket. And now we're going to remove the pan and be careful, it's going to get a little messy. Alright, there we have our old crispy pan gasket and that's going to get replaced for sure and then the transmission filter right there as well I'm going to replace that it's very straightforward I actually didn't record myself doing it another thing to note and this is kind of obvious as well but only use clean rags this is a clean rag that I grabbed and I would toss them and grab another clean rag to clean the surface area 
Now, don't use dirty rags because the last thing you want is to get dirt all over your transmission internals while you're trying to put some clean fluid in. All right, so I have a transmission oil pump connected to the quart bottle, and I'm just going to be pumping the transmission fluid and using that method. And so this is this transmission is like many other modern transmissions from Toyota, and that check port that you see, the check port is open once the transmission has been filled and warmed up to the specified operating temperature range to level off the fluid. Warm up. I have my scanner here. We're going to be going into ECT, which is transmission. I'm going to let the temperature get to between 41 and 46 degrees Celsius or 106 to 115 degrees Fahrenheit. ECT. Live data. And I think I passed it. So I just saw it's automatic transmission oil temperature. So it's not there yet. It warms up very quickly to 41 to 46 degrees Celsius. And as soon as it gets to that temperature, we're gonna take our T30 and move the overflow for the check port. In the meantime, I'm gonna be shifting from park, reverse, neutral, and drive. And I'm gonna leave it in each gear for just a little bit to allow the fluid to make its way through the entire transmission. Almost there, 39. 41.2. Now once that fluid gets down to a trickle, you can go ahead and close up the check port, tighten it all up, and you are done. You are done with it. The transmission is done, the fluid is leveled off, and you are ready to go. Now, if you want to find the cheap and free version, you get that in this video too. Now all you really need is a paper clip to do this. You can create a jumper wire, which is very easy. You can look that up. We're going to be jumping two terminals here. We're going to be jumping CG number 4 and TC number 13. They're highlighted in red. Now here's a picture of my paper clip. I have it on CG and TC. It's the bridge for those two terminals. We're going to put that on and start up the car. Now don't get too startled here. All of the lights on your dashboard will be on and flashing and your auto will be high. I'm going to immediately put it into sport mode and shift down into first gear and up into sixth gear and immediately put it back into park. Then I'm immediately going to put it into drive and shift back and forth between neutral and drive, leaving it in each gear for about a second and a half. And I'm going to do this for about six seconds. Now during this step, I highly recommend to pay close attention to the drive indicator on your dashboard. The drive indicator will remain illuminated for about two seconds before it turns off, indicating that fluid temperature detection mode has been activated. Now when the transmission temperature is below the desired temperature range, the drive shift indicator will be off. When the transmission temperature is at the proper temperature range, the shift indicator will be on. And when the transmission fluid temperature is above the desired temperature range, the drive shift indicator will be flashing. And here the drive indicator is off, indicating that the transmission fluid temperature is below the desired range, which means it's under 41 degrees Celsius or 106 degrees Fahrenheit. Here the drive shift indicator is on, meaning that it's time to get underneath the car and open up the check port. This is that indicator that you are within the desired temperature range. And here, the drive shift indicator is now flashing, indicating that the fluid temperature is now above the desired temperature range needed in order to properly adjust and level out your transmission fluid. And that is it. You are done. Go ahead and pull your paper clip out and take your car for a test drive. If you've made it all the way through this video, I so, so appreciate you checking out this type of content. 
If this video helped you out in any way, shape, or form, a thumbs up is highly appreciated. And of course, if you're looking for quality aftermarket auto parts or genuine OE brands like Denso, Bosch, and the likes, check out aeroparts.com.